as Dara said, we're going to talk about our inclusive assessment and feedback publication. And first of all, just to say we're presenting as well on behalf of uh, the other editors of the case study publication. So Julie Tong, who's the Disability Officer in UCD and also currently the Chair of the Disability Advisors Working Network in Ireland. And I think she's actually um, here in the in the webinar with us. Um, and also Therese, Dr. Therese Moylan, who is the um, head of the Department of Entrepreneurship in IADT, so the Institute of Art, Design and Technology, and she's also the chair of the Teaching and Learning Committee in IADT, and Dr. Georgian O'Neill, who um, works with us in UCD in Teaching and Learning um, and is an expert in assessment. So we're going to talk you through, um, I'm going to give you an overview of the uh, publication. Um, and a bit of the background and context in our framework. And then Barbara is going to bring you through her case study, um, which is published uh, in the publication as well. So I so suppose just to get started to think about, so why did we think we needed to produce this publication on inclusive assessment and feedback? Well, a lot of common challenges for students. So first of all, over assessment, and this will be familiar to anybody working in an educational environment. So we have seen, I suppose ourselves in UCD, um, an increase in the amount of assessment that students are doing. So we moved to a modularized um, model within UCD, which in some cases um, has meant that our students are um, very heavily assessed throughout the academic year, which might mean a lot of competing deadlines as well for students. We've seen new assessment types, which is fantastic. We want diversity in assessment, but we've seen those assessment types in some cases being brought in without the necessary support. So for example, um, saying, great, you can do a podcast for this assessment, fantastic, but actually the students not necessarily knowing how to go about that or not having the support to gain the skills that they'd need to succeed in that assessment method. And then scheduling and commitments, because we know a lot of our students now are working outside of college. They have other commitments, whether that's um, childcare commitments, elder care commitments, um, and they're really balancing a really heavy load in college and outside of college as well. In terms of staff, so faculty and staff, obviously the growing numbers of students presents a challenge when we think about how we would assess and how we would provide feedback um, in an environment where we've had static or even reduced resources. And I was thinking about our current circumstances and the results that that might bring in terms of resources as well. And then assessment to meet external requirements brings with it its own set of challenges. So whether that's a professional body, um, industry or whatever it might be. So having to assess students, we have, having to show that they meet particular competencies and um, that being in some cases limiting when it comes to the type of assessment you might do. And also an increase in students who are availing of reasonable accommodations, which of course is positive um, for the students in terms of them getting supports. But in when we look at traditional modes of assessment, the increased number of students who use reasonable accommodations just present some, even at least logistical challenges. So within the publication, we've presented this framework which maps inclusive assessment concepts onto universal design for learning. And we've also included universal design for instruction. So we can just see how all of this works together. Um, but so just to go through some of the inclusive assessment concepts that we really focus on, one of them is transparent assessment. So students know exactly how they're going to assess, be assessed, when they're going to be assessed. They know that from the beginning of the semester, they can plan accordingly. They have things like a rubric, which tells them how they're going to um, be graded, what they need to do to get an A, um, that they have scaffolded assessment. And that's what I was talking about when I referred to a student who might be asked to do a podcast. So scaffolded assessment means we give the students then the skills and resources that they need to succeed with that method of assessment. And then choice of assessment, and um, Dr. Georgian O'Neill has done a huge amount of work on this, but that's where we might say to a student, well, you can either do an assignment or you can do an exam. You can either do a presentation or you can do a poster. And that can work really, really well. And there are lots of frameworks that you can use within that so you can ensure parity um, and equity for students as well. And then variety of assessment. What we don't want is that our students are assessed in the same way all the way throughout their semester, throughout their degree, um, so that everybody has a chance to play to their strengths. So if, for example, you're assessing through essay, and it's just essay after essay after essay, and there's never another means to show that you've met the learning outcomes, that can be quite challenging for a number of students. Then authentic assessment. So thinking about the subject that you're teaching and how you might assess that in an authentic way. So for example, 
when are timed exams appropriate or when are they authentic? Well, we might look at something like in a medicine degree, is it appropriate to do um, OSCE exams where we test students out and they are testing their clinical skills? Yes, I think that's appropriate. But if you're doing a literature degree, do we need to do a timed exam where we're giving somebody an essay to write in an extremely limited amount of time? Is that authentic based on the subject that you're teaching? Obviously, self-assessment, peer assessment, excuse me, <coughs> are both really important. And then also a programmatic approach. So that's, I think, somewhere where there's a lot of work that can be done. And I know the National Forum have done a lot of work on uh, promoting a programmatic approach to assessment. So that you'll step back with your colleagues and look at how, how are we assessing this degree? How can we work together to make sure that we're not over relying on a particular assessment method and that we're giving students scaffolded supports and staged supports. So in first year, this, this is the module where we're going to teach them how to write an essay. This is the module where we're going to teach them how to do a presentation and that everybody works together. So that avoids the kind of duplication of effort and also means that students do feel supported all the way through. Um, do you have supportive policies in place in your institution? And finally, do you have an opportunity for staff development? Because while we may push things like diversity of assessment and using new assessment types, it's important that we're supporting faculty actually to, to gain the skills themselves that they might need to teach students how to do a podcast or how to do a video. So this just gives a little bit of context in terms of the number of students with disabilities in higher education. I know most of you are probably very familiar with this, but obviously the numbers are increasing year on year. And in our, our university in UCD, again, the numbers are increasing year on year. So we're seeing more and more students with disabilities come forward to avail of supports. But really the primary concern of those students is around assessment. So they're looking for advice around exam accommodations, assessment methods, and I would say at the moment, even more so, than usual. So in terms of inclusive assessment and disability support, and obviously that's from our context, one of our major motivations in terms of promoting inclusive assessment, we do have increasing numbers seeking support and particularly support in exams. We have increasing numbers of students requesting reasonable accommodations for in-class tests where previously it might've been just that major end of semester exam that was a concern for students. Now we're seeing far more students who actually require supports for the smaller in-class assessments and also students who are looking for alternative assessment methods. So students who feel they can't do presentations or are struggling with group work. So we have, as I've said, seen an increase in the variety of assessment types, but not all of those assessment types are accessible. So that's where universal design really comes in. So when you're at your module design stage, you're designing your assessment and your feedback, you're thinking about making sure that your assessment methods are accessible to everybody in the classroom. And some faculty are reporting that they don't know what inclusive assessment means. So that's why we were very clear in terms of the framework that we set out in this publication. So we know what actually does it mean to be inclusive when it comes to doing an assessment? Because I think even the word inclusion can have lots of different means, meanings in lots of different contexts as just like the word diversity can. And we know faculty as well are struggling and they're under pressure in terms of marking loads. So if you've got 500 students in a module, how can we make sure that everybody is assessed inclusively everything is accessible and that they can get their feedback in a timely way. And that's why we see sometimes an over-reliance on the end of semester exam. So this is my last slide. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the collaboration that we did with IADT. So um, we have a previous publication on universal design for curriculum design, where we have case studies from UCD. And this time we decided to collaborate with um, our colleagues in IADT for a number of different reasons. We have a really good relationship with IADT. Um, UDL is part of the ongoing teaching and learning CPD in IADT, just as it is in UCD. And also, while our campuses are quite diverse, we have quite a few similarities in terms of our student diversity, our assessment and teaching and learning. Um, the disciplines in across our, both of our campuses are quite different. So obviously an Institute of Art Design and Technology, they're teaching for quite different subjects in some cases than we are in a research intensive university. But that meant that we had really good diversity across the case studies that we got. Um, so I'm gonna pass over to Barbara now, as I said, who's going to give you an overview of her case study, uh, which is included in the publication. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. So, um, 
to, to carry on from what uh, Lisa was describing, one of the case studies that is included in the book is on um, the assessments that we redesigned in UCD for a university access program. So this is a program for students, it's a level six program, and it, is, um, it attracts the kind of learners that a lot of you have posted in here today as the kind of students that you're supporting. So students who've been absent from the classroom for quite some time, who are distant from higher education, who may be managing in a second or an other language, um, and for whom uh, higher education is an unknown or, or a strange uh, landscape. Um, and they, they come directly to us in UCD and within the course of a year, working with my colleague Thoman Coogan, they are aiming to progress into degree programmes. So the key for them there is their capacity to move um, into a, an autonomous or self-directed uh, learning. So the key for them is to develop critical thinking and reflection. And obviously we, we know that we are successful there if we can reinforce that through the assessment uh, process. So um, the, what we um, spend a lot of time with the, the students is developing um, the uh, self-confidence and self-esteem and encouraging them uh, to write more, to engage more, and really to begin to uh, develop a sense of entitlement uh, around their, their, their role as university learners. And um, one of the key elements in doing that, of course, is to develop a, the type of assessment that will help them develop those skills and give them um, key feedback. So uh, the access course that I'm describing here has been um, running, it's the oldest running um, access program in Ireland. It's been um, running for more than 20 years. And one of the, uh, the only assessment that was on it at the time when I was teaching on it was a learning journal. So students kept two long learning journals and, and at the end of each semester, they offered a summary reflecting on the key themes from that module. Now, one of the challenges that we had as staff in trying to correct those was that uh, we noticed that uh, not un unreasonably, students tended to avoid keeping a regular journal. So they left, left everything to the last minute and um, offered up um, a, a quick summary at the end. Um, they didn't receive any feedback during the course of the semester. So they, it was, it was a, a, a one submission. Um, and in the absence of keeping regular journals, they tended to read a bit like um, kind of the um, captain's log, you know, week one, we, we covered this, week two, we did that. And at the end of it, we went home tired, but happy. So the kind of the journals tended not to be that critical. So we took the opportunity um, to redesign that. So myself and Thomond and our colleagues in, in UCD, Michelle, Tracy, um, looked at, at the materials that were available through uh, UDL. And we considered what would an inclusive assessment look like that would prompt those students to be reflective and that would give them feedback in real time. So this is what we came up with. We redesigned the module and what we did is we changed the assessment from one sub single submission to four shorter ones. Now I know um, Lisa talked earlier about over um, assessment, but in this case we made everything shorter. Um, so we designed the assignments to really to get students to move from that descriptive writing that is, is, is so intuitive and more, most comfortable to us all, and then nudge them through descriptive reflective and ultimately get them to that point where they critically reflect. And we used the features in our new virtual learning environment to give regular student feedback. And the feedback we considered, and, and Lisa's referred to feedback earlier, as critical. If students obviously can, can get timely feedback, they can adapt and adjust their learning. So for I'm showing on, on the screen an example of the first assignment. So in the redesign, students are being assessed almost immediately. So it doesn't become a big issue, it becomes part of their, their learning. So within two weeks of starting with us, we give them a, uh, an early assignment, which in this case is called my learning approach at university where they um, just offer 500 words and they're given several prompts and those prompts lead them to, to write in a more critical way. And ultimately what we're asking them to do 
is to consider their learning approach and think of an example that, um, that was um, effective in supporting their learning. Uh, we then go on to, for example, get them to start reading newspapers more critically would be a, a, another easier transition. So in this case, we get them to um, analyze a text from um, a journalist, an Irish Times journalist, and they have to respond to particular issues um, within that. So a, a relatively comfortable transition for them. So in total, there are four assignments. And in order to get the feedback that we refer to, we use the, um, a system um, a rubric in our new virtual learning environment. So um, Lisa talked earlier about things being transparent. So it's very clear to the students very early on what it takes to be excellent, what it would take to pass the assignment, and uh, in the unlikely event, what those kind of attributes would be if they failed. So in this case, I'm showing an example now of what it would look like if they received um, a rubric for their fourth assignment. So in, in the example that I'm showing, uh, a student uh, meets all the excellent criteria under both quality of writing and developing their argument. And there are feed, there's feedback comments given directly to that student so they can see what it was that gave them that grade. And critically, at the very end, they get a personalized piece of feedback and in this case, the example here is the student is told that was an exceptionally well-written assignment. You have such an easy and competent writing style, well done, etc. So that the student is getting that in real time. I'm going to finish now on uh, the student voice. And in this case, the student says, the feedback on essays was amazing, detailed, honest, and really encouraged me to dig deeper. The pace of the lecture was perfect, going at a good pace, etc. The um, assessment on essays, for example, encouraged me to go back and um, uh, on aspects, of course, that I might have missed the first time around. For example, writing an essay about writing encouraged me to go over previous lectures. I retained more of that information as a result. And I think that student comment reinforces the benefit in redesigning um, and using good UDL principles. And that's me. Okay, Lisa, over to you. Great. So here's the link if you did want to download it. I know Trevor shared it in the chat as well, and Christine included it in the resources um, for this session. So the full publication is available to download for free. Um, and you've got our email addresses there if you have any questions. But um, if anybody has any questions at the moment, we'd love to hear them. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Just to read that link out for anyone who could you would you mind reading that out, Lisa? Would that be possible? Yeah, no problem. So it's www.tinyurl.com forward slash inclusive assessment. Fantastic, brilliant. Thanks a million, guys. That was so interesting. Um, there's, there's a couple of questions coming in here, some really interesting ones. Uh, the first one comes from Patrick Sullivan, who's asking, what strategies are you employing to support the culture change in assessment in UCD? And what constraints are presented from external sources? So how do you respond to those those constraints within the university that, that are, you know, might, you might be academic council constraints or other things that might be getting in your way of doing the good work that you're doing? There's never any constraints in large organisations there, as you know. <laughs> um, so in terms of the culture change, this, was, this is part of the wider initiative in UCD called University for All. Um, so we're currently rolling that out. So what that means is um, basically we look at the university as a whole. So we look at teaching and learning, which includes assessment and feedback. We look at the physical campus, the student supports and services, and also the technology environment. Um, and we ask colleges so we just had our implementation strategy approved so each college will be asked to do a self-assessment based on all of those aspects including their assessment strategy um, and from that we'll come up with action plans for projects so this was an example of one of the projects that we're doing would be with the college of engineering and architecture um, we have an inclusive teaching pilot so 13 different mod modules from across that college we assessed how inclusive they were at the moment then all of those academics are going through kind of inclusive teaching workshops, um, peer reviews of each other's modules, we've got student feedback and then the redesign of the module happens and it will be um, run again next semester and we'll have a look to see whether those changes have meant an improvement in terms of the inclusive nature and at the end of that we'll have another publication of case studies with some discipline specific advice around how might you be inclusive in how you teach, how you assess, how you give feedback 
within engineering and architecture. So there's no, um, I suppose, one big bang answer as to how we solve any of it. But I think definitely kind of working away, working with colleagues and producing those examples of good practice is really important. Yeah, In terms of the constraints, I mean, it's things like um, time because everybody's under so much pressure. It's competing priorities between research and between teaching and assessment. Um, and resources as well. So whether or not you have enough um, resources, teaching assistance to, to support small group teaching or continuous conformative assessment. Thanks, Lisa. I know like, that, that's something I should have uh, announced that myself and Lisa are, are co-collaborators, co-conspirators on a, a UDL project, which is around the digital badge for universal design for learning. And that's certainly that idea of capturing good practice and sharing. It seems to be a really powerful motivator for others to, to get involved when they, when they see it in action, see what it actually looks like. Barbara, there's two questions um, for you in here. Um, one is from Anne Heelan. Hi, Anne. How's it going? Anne is a colleague, yeah. Anne, former director of AHEAD. So she's asking, um, she's just wondering uh, about the uh, HEI assessments and how they, they tend to rely on writing. And she's wondering what is the capacity to be assessed in different ways, just as Lisa mentioned about the, the podcast form. And is the task of writing actually a core skill that we need to assess within some of these modules or, or maybe is it more incidental? I suspect that's one that Anne can answer herself as well, but um, the the answer is is in uh, Lisa's earlier um, response. Uh, absolutely, uh, an alternative assessment can and uh, is uh, offered if if necessary. But I think um, what we're looking for is more of that capacity to critically reflect whether that is the physical act of writing or if it's the act of expression. But it is. Um, that the, the, our case study example is just an illustration of that and the, and the importance of being able to critically reflect. I don't think you need to physically be able to write that, but you do need to be able to express it. Great, thank you, Barbara. And there's also a question, there's two questions actually relating to the rubric piece. One is from Sean, who, um, Sean Bracken, who was speaking previously there. Sean asks, is there potential in the future for the students themselves to be involved in developing the rubric? Or, yes. Uh, yeah. And also as well, um, a related question, Mike asks, do you have any tips for encouraging students to engage with grading criteria and rubrics? Uh, the, he says the assessment literally the assessment literacy piece. So it's about uh, how do you engage students to understand the rubric and to understand their role in meeting the rubric? But they're, they're, I mean, they're good questions and the rubric is um, an area that I, I'm very persuaded by because it's transparent so the students can see exactly what's required and you can edit and change it then um, when, when the feedback comes in. So in fact, the rubric we have this year has altered from, when, from what we would have done in the first design. And that can change again and again over time. And the student voice is so important there. Um, and the student experience and even the student cohorts as they go through change. So you do need to be responsive and reactive. Uh, and within UCD, we have a really uh, good panel of access leaders who are trained in advocacy, who would be very uh, responsive to us and um, encourage us uh, in aspects of that as well. So I think, and I also see the rubric as a really um, sustainable approach. I mean, no trees are killed or felled in offering all this feedback and you can, you can publish the feedback very quickly and you can then, you can see when students are engaging with it. So they can come back, in, in my example, they will have their feedback within uh, three weeks of starting the course, they'll have already got their first piece of feedback and they can come back and talk to you about that. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think that timely feedback piece is so important yes. in, in kind yeah. of building students' ability to actually uh, to yeah. meet the assessment. Yeah. So yeah. I think we're going to come to our last question. So if, if you wouldn't mind, Luan and Deborah, if you could begin to turn, uh, unmute yourselves for the next session, that would be great. So I think this one is more uh, focused at Lisa. So it's just about what types of PD for lecturers and staff are available. And is it part of the plan that you roll out this PD yourself? And I suppose just to, to mention about this in terms of the wider idea of universal design for learning, I mentioned myself and Lisa have collaborated on the digital badge for UDL and it's a, that's an AHEAD UCD Access and Lifelong Learning collaboration. So that runs twice a year nationally, but it's also available for some local facilitators as well. So if you want the information about that, go to ahead.ie slash UDL and go to the, the digital badge page there. But is there anything else you'd like to add, Lisa, on that one? So we have quite a few colleagues in UCD who have done the badge and who are currently doing the badge as well. 
um, with myself and Trevor. Um, so that has worked really well. We embedded the UDL badge in our professional certificate and diploma in teaching and learning in higher education. So again, kind of embedding in existing frameworks for professional development. So you're not asking faculty to give up additional time and you're also kind of making use of the the pool of people who are there already. And I think anybody who works in an access department certainly to collaborate with your teaching and learning colleagues on professional development um, works extremely well. I mean, we've collaborated with Geraldine on this publication. We collaborated with Dr. Terry Barrett on the previous one. Um, they very much have their ear to the ground. They know what's going on in terms of the way students are being assessed. Um, the way they're being taught and also the opportunities for professional development. So I think we it's embedded as well in the University for All rollout, but I think every opportunity, so the digital badge and other kind of bespoke workshops we would offer as well. 